I guess the, the trappings of uh, what rock stardom is. You know, staying in the really, really nice hotels and uh, fine dining. You know, jetting to shows and, you know, never even having to touch your gear. And uh, a manager who treated us like rock stars. It was first class, five star, all the way. It was what I'd always heard. What, rock stardom was. But that was the 94 tour. We didn't have that in 96. We had none of that on the Sphinx tour. I'm Reynolds Washam, former drummer of the band Ministry. That's me there with the sticks and the hat. Waiting to follow Motorhead on the stage in a place called Saxonia. Okay, man, it's time. It's time to become the king of Saxonia. Meet Alan Jorgensen, founding father, no less, of a new form of rock and roll. Yeah! What came to be known as industrial music. I thought they were good and funny, you know. And that's good for me, in my book, that puts you up there in the top five, if you're funny, you know. Phase, you know, my bootiest period, I guess, or something. I know, I just wanted to look like Nancy Sinatra, basically, you know. I never could get the hair to go right then. Uh, you know, I've never had a bit of this before. <laughs> and you're going to kick your ass. Well, I, I don't have to prove anything anymore. I live to be 62. But, you know, that's it. That's, that's the proof of my validity. Fuck you, you know. Like, My dream was to be, you know, like Al. That's, I mean, he, was, he was the most creative guy out there at the time. And it seemed like he didn't give a shit when anyone thought about it. And, you know, I mean, now he's on a big label. Great, I'm going to make the weirdest, hardest, most inaccessible record. It's a cool thing to be inspired by. You know, it felt like that, that was the thing that was really important to me in my way life turned out. Ah! 
How about fucking Motorhead, yeah? They fucking rocked! But we'll fucking kick your ass too! To Stop 69! That guy, Al Jorgensen, was uh, Gibby, G Gibson Haynes from the Butthole Surfers and I were, uh, we were living uh, right outside Toledo, Ohio at the time, and uh, we were penniless. We were just flat ass broke, and we'd get money by, we sort of hung out at the Greyhound station there and would suck dick for a pretty low price, and uh, that's, we called it work. You know, each morning I'd see him up there and then, well, welcome to work, and we'd do that shit. And uh, we, we saw this sort of dorky looking, sort of like, you know, goth wannabe kid. We'd always like, he'd be looking at us and kind of, you know, he'd come over and go, hey, hey, you guys, what, what are you, what are you, what are you guys doing? And that was the young Al Jorgensen. And... Hey, get out of my film. Shut up, Al. <laughs> get the fuck out of my film. This, this is videotape, this is enough about film. you. Let's go back to me. <laughs> cut, cut. Cut. Get Eventually, we took him under our wing, and uh, he he learned to suck cock as good as Gibby and I do. And uh, eventually, he ended up making a whole lot more money at this uh, penis suckery than we ever did. So that's uh, that's the way that goes. I think when the record company arrived, Seymour Stein came to the studio we were working in. I think he was hoping to hear. Um, a continuation of what Al had done previously and he turned up. We played him something that sounded vaguely commercial that Al had no intention of putting on the record. But if my memory serves me rec, I think, uh, correctly, I think at the time we were staying up three, four nights in a, in a row and the favoured substance was like speed, to be honest with you. And I think some of that might be, might have been slipped into the record company's uh, drink or something, but I don't want to say any more. It wasn't too bad, you know. I'm flashing to this. Okay, so if ministry had never formed, what would Al, do, what would Al be doing? I just kind of picture this really grumpy elementary school teacher. <laughs> <laughs>
Did you know that's where he was? No way, really? <laughs> He's a kiddie English legend. I was very excited that ministry was going to be part of you know, the, our family. I never minded, you know, how difficult they were to deal with because I loved what they did as artists. That's like my, that was always my, um, the most important, you know, factor for me in dealing with artists. If I respected them, I don't care what they did. There was never any time when we'd say to Al, you know, we need you to do this artistically. You know, most times when an artist wants to, you know, go in the studio and record what they want to record, the way they want to do it, most record companies have allowed that. I'm not being Pollyannish about this. It's it's true, especially at Warner Brothers. I'm pretty much useless when it comes to anything except being me. And I learned from Timothy Leary that is the, that is really the key in life, and William Burroughs as well, in the sense that uh, you must reach a point where you get this society to really think you're important enough and valuable enough in your knowledge or intuition or whatever gift you have to get paid in a secular society so you can live without worry. You can live without secular worry just by being you. Yeah, that's all it takes. It felt like music that spoke to me and it was aggressive and it sounded, it didn't feel retro, it didn't feel like it was modeled after some 70s archetype of what a rock band should be or something based on the on the Beatles or or uh, Black Sabbath or something like that. But it was using technology and things that didn't exist prior to that in a way that was abusing them and it felt like there were no rules and it felt like, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and say I haven't been inspired by that and been, been borrowed probably more than I should have at times, you know, but... It really was from a position of um, respect, and the, I mean, those guys were. You see a band that was so good, you know, and I'm in a band that it pisses you off, and it's not good, but it's it's good to get your ass kicked like that because the bars, okay, that's the new thing to you know be, rather than constantly wondering how do people like this shit, and you know, I got I got a good ass kicking from out a number of times on on a on a creative level. Except, except, except when he was unbelievably hostile, and it was almost like he was bipolar or something. It was like, it was like, what, do, what does he need right now? Right now he needs, right now he needs to be, you know, he needs to be liked. So he's gonna be, so he's so charming and funny that he can always be liked. He can make you like him even after he's punched you in the face. And then sometimes he just need, he just needs to be, he needs to be insane because he's insane, and that's just the price of doing business with Al Jorgensen. So I went to Chicago. My first trip to visit Al at his home in Chicago. He said if I come, he'd, he'd play me what he, we, what he had done. He never did play me anything that he had done. But we had a great time going to a Blackhawk game. It was my first hockey game. And it was really fun. And it was great. And I could see Al was really emotional and really uh, got really, really viscerally involved in the game. I got my 666 Satan Hawks jersey. And I sit right on the glass. And finally, Bosch, you do something wrong. You got to deal with me for two minutes. I'm constantly on the end. And he has to start. Point. I, I can't remember the name of the team, it was some poor Canadian team that was playing against the Blackhawks. Al literally led the entire stadium in this horrible, vicious chant against the goalie from the other team. And I, mean, I think the guy was had, had a breakdown 
It was like, I was like, in this, like I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was, it seemed like so mean. Uh, we're here with Paul Barker, Ministry in town tonight for Gig at Varsity Arena. It's our pleasure to sit down and chat and uh, talk a little rock talk. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Philadelphia City Paper, is this a weekly rag or is it at Paley? Uh -huh. Last time we played in Philadelphia, the promoter pulled a gun out on us. So we have, we have fond memories of Philadelphia. No, yeah, absolutely, for sure. <clears throat> well, I'm so thrilled because I mean, I always, I always like it when people, you know, sense the humor in the band and otherwise, you know, it's... There's this fucking guy that looks just like Barker's been kidnapped and this gay bar guy came by <laughs> and said he wants to fucking put Fabio on the guest list, whatever that is, and so oh, she's Oh, Fabio a here, man? Fabio, Viking man. There's Val Hella, <laughs> Thor, Odin, oh, and Fabio. I don't know what inspired it. I mean, basically just, um the will to make ugly music, you know, to make powerful ugly music. It's so incredibly satisfying and, and second nature, I suppose, in that sense. I mean, fucker put me on hold. We sent over, or I sent over, actually, a, a carton of ministry uh, CDs. It might have been cassettes, but a, a whole lot of mu ministry music to the, an Air Force base that was going over to Iraq. And then we got back this letter from an, uh, a fighter who told us that he, he you know, thanking, thanking us for sending the music and how much they liked the music. And then he went into this thing how they were using the music on the bombing runs of Baghdad. And they'd use the ministry music to get all pumped up and then bomb Baghdad. Dude, you're rad because uh, when we go on our bombing raids in Iraq, we listen to one of your songs and when we drop the payload and the ordinance, it's fucking kick ass. I mean, it, it, it's just like, uh, like the whole point is mistaken, you feel like responsible. I mean, you go through a myriad of emotions that are just really weird that you, you, you don't want to deal with, you don't think about when you're, all you're doing is writing music, you're expressing creativity, anger, whatever, you're, you're a mirror of society, you put it on the tape and you let it go. And all of a sudden, two years later, five years, 10 years later, 10 months, whatever, you get these interpretations of what you're doing that that you feel like you have to answer or or have feelings for and all that you almost have to divest yourself and become like uh really unfeeling which is really also not you because it's the feeling and everything else that makes you create in the first place so it's it's kind of a dichotomy and a paradox it's, it's just creepy i hate it people are being killed and they're stoked because your music's playing, or they, they capture Iraqi prisoners and they blast your music to make them insane and to give up troop movements so more people can be killed. Yet you get these other things where like, I was gonna commit suicide, then I heard your song and I understand it, man. You just have to divest and just realize what you're doing is just to, to satisfy your own angst. <laughs> like I said, to be paid to be yourself, you know? Um, I'm not a world changer. The world changes, and if I'm in it... At the height of alternative rock, when people were really looking for weird shit, and he was, you know, he was providing the weirdest shit out there, he knew that he had it, that he had the talent and the vision and the stature to be a major star, but engaging the system in that way was just out of the question, because it's not who he is. The success that, the success that he had was the mainstream coming to him. He wasn't going to take a single step towards uh, any, anybody else. He really was the, the wild, you know, the, the most out of control wild man in, in the entire music industry, and that was just that was what he was. And with ministry, there was always a very, it was always, it was always a very hard to know where the money was going because they because they'd say that they needed in, a lot of money for props, or they say that they needed a lot of money for for rehearsals, and and they seemed to need a lot, not a lot of money for people. And sometimes these props and these rehearsals and these people didn't actually seem to be materializing. <laughs> samples and spoken stuff is played it's not like no tape behind the band like a few other bands i know one in particular from chicago <laughs> um, it sounds like a fucking record is playing and they're playing behind it you know what i mean who wants to see some shit like that that's where it starts 69 69 69 this is the chorals Dun, uh, sample i feel my heart's been whatever by christ
it's not even it's not even the fun anymore of um of like like the fun that it used to be not the naivety of rock you know it becomes so corporate at this point that you have professional fucking groupies professional vultures professional everything to where the point is like the people throw themselves in front of cars for cash settlements you get people taunting you on stage hoping that you'll finally just give up and throw something at them so they can claim something and get a piece of you financially you get girls that just want rape like mike tyson or something right, right, right. so they can fucking sue you and get you know publicity for their book or whatever a national choir you have professional fucking vultures that just tell you yes and what you want to hear you have professional fucking you know, dealers that follow you around preying on people that are just coming off detoxing or don't want it, you know? Let's just do it! Alright, we can do it now. It's, right. it's all the sleazy underbelly of this shit that I really don't like about this fucking scene. That's why I always said for years I'd rather be in the studio outside of maybe the first two tours, which of course is the ones that, that people think like, God, how could you like that tour? You're in a station wagon with a to Vito hotel and all that. That's when it was fun. Yeah. Nothing was professional, nothing was fucking, you know, you're not accountable for anything. It's more of a bohemian lifestyle. It's more what I always thought rock was going to be, you know? This is fucking pathetic. I mean, there's ways to have fun during it, but mainly you pick yourself a good crew in the band. That's the way we've always done it. And, and hang together as Vikings almost, you know? If you even have even a borderline issue with substances, you get on the road and it just amplifies. Because once again, you have all those sycophants out there you know, your friends that are coming out to the shows in different cities, and to them it's a vacation and a party. But, you know, it's a different set of those people. And they're your good friends. They're not, they're not like, they're not shitty people. They're, they're, good, they're good people, but, you know, they've been working all week, and now they're on the weekend, and you're in town, and they haven't seen you in forever, and look, at, it's a party! And then, so you have this, that kind of stuff happening in every city, and after a while you have alcoholics in, in your band, because, you know, they can't say no. All right, the opening acts that we had on that tour, we had to assure them that we wanted them to open for us in spite of the amount of shit that they got, you know, thrown at them, abuse hurled at them, that sort of thing. jamming by myself is when it feels the best, you know, and I think to myself, well, do I want to keep dealing with people, you know, and attitudes and, you know, personality crisis and 
And then again, I say, well, you know, maybe that's what it's all about, you know. I made eye contact with one of the women that was sitting there with her daughter, you know, like the fifth row or something like that. And I could see on her face, like, if I see your dick, I'm gonna ruin your fucking life. To these people, Al is like, you know, weird drug god kind of uh, untouchable, um, indestructible, you know, how the hell is he still alive kind of guy, like Keith Richards or some, you know, some, um, Hunter Thompson. Wish me luck. As a friend, not as a filmmaker, as a friend to you, Skull. I'm sure even our shittiest show is still a decent show, as long as the band doesn't have a complete meltdown on stage and stop in the middle of a song. you don't understand, then you suffer. Stevie Wonder. And this is how ministry spends their days off, taking care of her talismans. So, slave to fashion? What? All my fucking talismans around me. My oils. Hey. Whatever works makes me feel a little bit more protected. Do you have faith in any of this stuff? Enough to fucking go through this. <laughs> Basically, I know I know white magic, black magic, and I have my own magics, and I believe in spells, and I I've read as much as I possibly can of the fucking you know Quran, Torah, fucking Bible, fucking. I need a from Anton LaVey to fucking Crowley to fucking uh, Huxley to me is a religion in itself to the fucking Masonic rites to uh, I just I just read to the fucking teachings of Buddha to fucking whatever you know. Do you consider yourself religious? I consider myself very spiritual. Yeah, religious. I don't know what is religious. I know your band's called Ministry. I don't know. Ministry is more of a, I don't know, a ministry is a political thing based, you know, out of Ministry of Defense, Ministry of this, Ministry of that, in European culture, that's what it was based on. Let me, let me go distribute some of these out. Be right back. I'm a real superstitious fuck. I'm pathetic when it comes to that. Eating chicken 11 days in a row of the shows go good. Or uh, wearing the same pairs of socks, underwear, back. I mean, it's the same thing you hear in sports stars or Broadway or or whatever, people have their superstitions and their rituals that they go through. And I guess that ritual would extend to like, uh, you know, being afraid of, of, of basically the outcome and just anesthetizing yourself to the point of like, well, if I do fuck up or if the ritual doesn't work tonight, if eating the bat wing soup and the chicken for the 13th straight day doesn't work, well, at least I won't care because I'm wasted out of my fucking mind. Shit! 
Being on the road so long in one bus, I mean, once we, we got, you know, more and more successful, we fucking all got our own bus. Corn did. We still do that now, to this day, because I love them all to death. We all love each other. It's all cool and all brothers, but I can't fucking stand when we're in fucking, like you say, 18 and fucking inches away in bunks. He was always around everybody. For me, I had to get out because I was the one that was sober and everybody else was partying, so I just couldn't be around it. It freaked me. I would, it just, when you get sober, you just like see drunk people and it pisses you off. Because it reminds you of how you used to be and all this crazy shit, just some weird trippy shit. But in those early days, being in a bus or even in a van, that shit's fucking hard. It's not fun at all. I mean, people think it's, oh, the glamour shit. Hell no. Fucking almost getting, dying in car wrecks to fucking food poisoning, illness, projectile vomiting, people sleepwalking, pissing in other people's bunks. Um, all the shit that goes on you can't control is fucking hell. And it's fucking horrible. But you know, you press on because you love doing what you do. You love being on tour. And all the partying you do because you're young and you can do it. I mean, it comes worse to them, but when it comes time to go to the next city, it's hell. That's what we're surrounded with, is either professional vultures or, or these people that are just fans of the event. I mean, preach the thing for yourself. Not to fucking blow the whole crew so you can get backstage and meet a band member. You know, that shit's gotta be let out too. It's not just fucking all fun and games and chicks and all that shit. I mean, even when we get chicks, it's fucking a big pain in the ass, you know? Everything's fucked up. My basic intent was either to get a blowjob or scare them right out of the fucking room. You know, the camera's on. Hey, what's happening? Oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It is. It's just it nice. flashing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fucking erase button in there, man. So wait a second. So it was either a blowjob or they were even scared the hell out. What happened? I wasn't even in town. I was back. I was here. <laughs> Settle down. It's just about ministry. It's all right. Don't worry. Oh, I know. I know. I know how it feels. It's invaders. In the mean streets. What would we do without these dogs? You know, it was dogs like this that warned the Indians about Custer. And we all know what happened to him. I had this girlfriend when I lived in Seattle. And, uh, uh, she enjoyed the rock and roll lifestyle. I mean, you know, the lifestyle. Enjoyed the lifestyle a little more than I would have liked to have, uh, or been willing to admit at the time. And, uh, ministry rolls through town anyway. And, uh, so for some reason I wasn't able to go to the show and, uh, Two weeks later, I get a call from fucking Oxnard. I haven't seen her in two weeks. And uh, she wants me to wire her money for a fucking bus ticket back to Seattle because she's been on tour with Ministry this whole time. She took it upon herself to become a uh, touring ornament. Can we get like 10 passes though to get quick blowjobs for relief? Seriously, very quick. Give it to these guys. So in other words, you know what to say. Like, look, the band wants sex, nothing else. I don't want to hold hands. I don't want cute little girls. Does that mean we wait an hour? No, I mean we wait ten minutes max. So you guys got to know this is an approach. Look, it's not scaring off your nose, right? You just say, look, the band loves sex. The band needs to go. Okay. You want to have sex with the band? I mean, basically, right up front approach. You know, Doug, you're laughing, but you know it works sometimes. And if it doesn't, so they're not gonna hit you. You're just like, hey. The only people backstage these days, and fucking, if, if you're on a tour with somebody else who's calling the shots, the only people backstage are the security. You know, which is fucking really boring. I didn't get into this to fuck security guys, I get into this to fuck girls, you know. That's the only thing that, that's the only point of being in this fucking thing, you know. I need the music, yeah, but I learned that later, you know, I mean. This gal says, just an autograph, and I'm out of here. She got to see a good half the country. And I won't be like, 
I'm so drunk, oh my god. I'll just like shake his hand, I'll be shaking like a leaf, I'll be so damn happy. Get the autograph, and then I'm gone. I fuck the judge, my country boner, it won't go down, it won't go down, it won't go down, my boner, my boner, my boner won't go down, it won't go down, it won't go down, my country boner, it won't go down. I fuck Willie Nelson, I fucked him deep inside. In the bathroom where he died I fucked to what you call Johnny Cash grabbed his ankles And he hollered when I fucked him I fucked the judge I fucked the judge My country boner It won't go down It won't go down to manifest. All women have it. All women have an, a fucking neurosis that is just inherent. It's genetic. So would you agree with Freud that love is a pathological state of mind? Oh, completely. Torture. Anything that fucks up your estrogen and your entire fucking biochemical makeup. That's a disease. Yeah, love is a disease. It's torture. I've had the opportunity to do lots and lots of tours and been dope sick and looking for the next fix and looking for the girl and looking for whatever the next thing is that I can either put in myself or that I can put myself into that's gonna take me out of my head, you know? And as a result, you miss all the beauty and all the amazing moments that, that you know, that are a result of your years and years of work. We would consider it for a split second, but and in those considerations, the answer would be no. Well, yeah, I mean, if they're pawns, that's exactly right. That's exactly why they won't let them change. You know, they want, they have a market, it, you know. It worked last time, it'll work again. But I mean, the idea of personal challenge maybe doesn't occur to a lot of people. You know, maybe they just dry up. Maybe they want to, I don't know, sit around and drink beer on their front porch or whatever. We have a fan base. We, you know, they know, we know what they like to hear. That's why we don't give it to them. <laughs> I mean, when I was on uh, the Mine is a Terrible Thing to Taste tour, where there was a cage put up between the audience and, uh, and the band. I mean, they were beating kids off with hoses. It was just, it was at times, I was just like, my God, like what, what has, you know, what demon is loose in this, in this venue right now that's causing all of this, you know? Because, uh, you know, Skinny Puppy, we had mass movements and we had energy, but it was never that type of energy. I mean, the darkness itself was more, I mean, it was self-evolving in the sense that I think all kids go through that when they're growing up. They, you know, if you're an artist, you start drawing trees and birds and flowers and then you move to monsters. You just, you like explore that part of your psyche at an early age. And I think, you know, Al always had a good point. One, one thing Al always said to me, which cracked me up, was he just goes, you know, at every show he goes, man, I just feel like a fucking like overpaid babysitter. You know, these parents like give their kids 50 bucks so they can stay home and fuck. And uh, I'm looking after the crew out here, you know. <laughs> this guy here, Jolly Roger, six foot eight, 300 pounds, security. I love this lifestyle. Ooh. 
happening was finally some commercial success was um, rewarded you know in a kind of uh, a I don't mean to say formula in a bad way but something was stumbled upon that had a had a, a market and uh, an audience there's a, there's a juggling act that goes on of do I want to give them what they want you know which I, I made and I guess I could or do I have to follow this thing that's gonna bum everybody out probably you know but might be greater in the long run but you know. Want me to lay it low with this thing? Yeah. Right this shot, number four. Right now, talk to you, I'm having fun. To me, it's like having a casual drink, having a beer, you associate having a beer, having a cocktail. Like in all the movies and all that stuff, it's a beer, right? But because of laws, this, Scarlet Letter S, this means I have problems, this means I rape, pillage, steal, I'm deep-rooted, fucked up. But to go have a social drink, it's accepted. What's the difference? Not a fucking thing, really. If you have father figures like Tim Leary or William Burroughs, there's going to be bumps in the road. Bring on Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Bring on Eastwood. Let's go. I'm ready. Yeah. Oh, a little bit high. Theory of all people considered so much of a godfather of turn on, tune in, drop out drug culture. Just what are we going to do about Al? This was Leary talking. He has so much potential. He's such an interesting guy and he's just killing himself. I feel more akin to as a father, as a son to Timothy Leary than I do my own father. I learned more from him in three, four years than I did in 15 from my real father. As far as what happened on the road, I mean, I think, uh, I don't think they were your typical meet and greet backstage kind of band. And Jeff, I think he's gonna say, hey Al, we're your record company. And Al's walking by with, with I believe with Timothy Leary in a wheelchair, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and Al looks up and says, former record company, <laughs> which is, you know, about as confrontational things he could, and then walked off, which is about as confrontational things he could possibly have done. So we're gonna sit here one more and we'll go. Uh, one more song. Uh, I'm ready to go. Uh, right. Stage, man. Uh, one more. Come uh, on, on the stage. Black right. man, better. I'll hold you to that. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the hallway is very full. We are going to take a wheelchair that way. Ladies and gentlemen, if Timothy Larry had the good sense to leave the dressing room, I think everyone should. So the boys can put on their frilly things. Yeah, frilly things. I hope they realize it's their last goddamn chance. person that has been with me through most all the shit was my uh, bodyguard Loke um, 
and he's inherited every psychotic trait from me now just by hanging out with me he started having panic attacks he started fucking all this all this shit i went through just because he had to hang out with me he's inherited that it just happens when you're around someone that fucking much it's gonna fucking happen and i feel sorry for look i look at him like i'm sorry i fucked you up bro because i would go on some trips man and you know what i hate I hate weird people People that are just odd. Why do you hate them so? People that just gotta be like original. Do they make you nervous? <laughs> Why can't they be regular? Huh? Is there something about them that scares you? Threatens you? Nobody knows what the fuck is going on, right? All, all we know is what we think we know. So why the fuck would I pass my like uh, view view on you or my lifestyle on you if that's not what you choose to do, you know? Who gives a fuck, you know? Who am I to tell you don't do that, don't do drugs, don't do fucking, do whatever the fuck you wanna do. It's one thing that Al does for me that that uh, very few people have done for me in life is he gets a full range of emotion from you. You know what I mean? And he does, and, and that's why people love him and people hate him, because, because he, he is, the type of person to make you feel every emotion that you have. People hide, everybody pretends like, you know, everything is so good and shit, when they know shit is fucked up. Unless the other people involved are supportive in some way, or take a back seat, and are actually protective of that insane person, or people, uh, you have to have an infrastructure that protects them, otherwise I think they can go so far that they never come back. And that's, that's generally the tragedy, the, the payoff of you know, using the, the, the chaotic and erratic behavior or the drugs or the alcohol to kind of get to those spaces. Eventually, the, you know, the drugs and the alcohol come to collect their, their pay. And I felt that I had to fulfill this need of people to live through me. I had to be that guy. It kind of made, turned me into that. And maybe that's what he feels, that he has to be the Al Jorgensen, the man bigger than life, the heroin god, drug, alcohol. Maybe he feels that he has to be that because that's that superhero character that he created. It's just a show, man. But to you, the whole context of the caricature is pretty life consuming. It gets, it gets to be crazy. Some, sometimes I wonder, especially with Al, that he's almost more addicted to being the life of the party than he is to the drugs or booze themselves. Survival and some semblance of inner peace depends, I think, on being able to uh, check your rock star self at the door. Uh, okay. What's wrong? Okay, it's a good yeah. fucking douche for us, you know what I mean? Okay, we get all the bullshit out of a bullshit show. Okay. I mean, this is the not no, it's true, because my shit is... I know, I was looking over here. Like, look, your fucking gate is opening, what's the fucking problem? Yeah, just okay. 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 We always sit back here. I know, I know, I'm sorry, Alex. Yeah, let's talk about our future shit. Okay, let's finish it. Okay. Hey. Yes, <laughs> please, I want to hear this Stigmata. shit. Stigmata. Stigmata. Stigmata's fine. Where's Ray? Ray! What? Stigmata! I'll go tell him. That's it. We're going out spawn up here. Oh. Let's start it off. Where's Stigmata? Ray! Put it out the loop. Okay. Say what? Stigmata, go ahead, start the loop. I'll be up in a while. Thanks. Alright, thank you for your support. They should never wake me up 45 minutes before a show. Got to sleep on a bus when I haven't slept in two days. And go rock. That's the place we got.
you hear these little bits from Al about, yeah, I'm going to go and, you know, this tour is going to, you know, I'm thinking about cutting the tour short or just like leading into the whole thing. Like he's just fixing to just jump the train right off the track and go and take a nap. It's like, fuck. I learned a lot from that. Because I had just started chipping at dope, you know, I just, my habit was just kind of taken off and why would I go to something that I knew was going to be the most horrible thing? Yeah, no, I'm not going to go and do the easy thing for the good money, I'm going to go off straight to hell. Of drugs together in the back of the bus and I was sitting up in the front talking to some people and Al came up and he said hey I'll, I'll be right back I'm gonna go get a bagel and he stepped off the bus and a moment later he came back on the bus and he goes no no, no I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm gonna go get a ham and cheese sandwich, I'll be right back. <laughs> and a second later, he came back in and he goes, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go get a, a tuna melt and I'll be back in like five minutes. <laughs> he got off the bus and then he came right back on and he said, no, I'm gonna go get some crack, I'm going to get some crack. And then he left. Well, suddenly there was there was a takeover at at, um, at Time Warner where the head of the music got, uh, division was this guy Bob Morgado, who didn't really know or care anything about music. He was just like a kind of a political guy, and he called me up and he started. And I had never spoken to him before. And he was my boss's boss's boss, and he's like screaming at me, "Why is this ministry record late? We have them on the budget for five hundred thousand records, and the, you're ruining." It. And he was just yelling and screaming, and I was like just in shock. I couldn't believe that anyone was talking to me like that. And I couldn't believe that it was someone so high up in the organization. And he was like, I didn't know what to say to him. I mean, yeah, well, they're late for every single record they've ever put out. And these, these numbers are all bullshit anyway. They're not, they're, these, these projections are nothing. They're just all, all a bunch of junk. And, and they just put the projections in so they could trick the people on Wall Street who then you know, make up their nonsense. It's just all a bunch of nonsense in corporate America. Finally, the guy drove me right to the wall and I just told him exactly why the record was late, which was because Al was in rehab. And the guy just started sputtering and he said, are you trying to tell me that we're working with drug addicts? And I, and I said, well, dude, you're in the record business. I mean, yes, we're working with drug addicts, lots and lots of them. They're not all like Al Jorgensen, but yes, lots of them. Al had to get obliterated to create. And you weren't allowed to listen to the music unless you were obliterated. They'd invite you to come down and you realize that when you were going down to hear new music from ministry, and you were going to go to Chicago Tracks and listen to the new music, that you were going to miss the next day of work. That was just a given. Uh, and you were not really allowed to even hear any music till you had snorted some heroin, till you had snorted some cocaine, till you had the right attitude in your brain. The edge was 100% real. I mean, and, and, and the story, and every day there was somebody was dead or somebody was arrested or somebody had disappeared. And, I mean, there was, there was shit going on in his head and around him that you couldn't make up. <laughs> they, weren't, they, 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 were, they, weren't, they were never on time, and they, and, they, and, they, and, they never did, they never did what you thought they were going to do, but they were never, you know, it was, it was, they, were more, they seemed like they were dangerous to themselves more than, more, than, more than to me. Keep in mind that the Eagles did this too, and for all I know, they still do, and it's kind of an open secret now that even in the psychedelic 60s, nobody was doing more drugs, especially the hard pills, than country musicians. I'm not sure that uh, Sire or even Aristo was all that upset with just how loaded Al was a lot of the time. 
Major labels like their stars on drugs because nine times out of ten, they are a great deal easier to control. All right, you know what's gonna be great is now we gotta let the record company text in because my dick is going in this chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, yes. no. Uh, no. 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 Yes. Oh God, it's not even cut. Okay, 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 okay. As we, as we would say, yeah, that's, not yeah. that's not kosher. Squeal. <laughs> Squeal. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Dahmer. I'd like to say a few things about sex. First of all, if you put antifreeze in a man's head, he'll do anything you say. That's a good I wonder if love this. Okay, record sex. Let him in one at a time. Take a Are bite of the chicken. Virgin, bite. <laughs> Mercury, bite. <laughs> White meat. The ministry bidding has begun. I may not quit the first time, but I learn something definitive each time that I quit that I don't go back to. And the whole problem is not just whether you're on drugs or not. The actual chemical and, you know, importance of it, to me, is the least important of it. So what did you learn out of this time? And not just, well, that, uh, I better not get caught. What did you learn? Because you can get into a rut without fucking chemicals. Just as bad, if not worse. Mm -hmm. Without the outlet of, like, fucking chemical release, you have some really deep-rooted fucking problems or dislike of yourself or something without any release. That's when you go apply at the post office, dude. I just got all fucked up one night. Came back. Wasted with my friend. I just got done drinking a bottle of Knob Creek, man, and <laughs> pulled up. You know that? Do you think I'm sexy? That that 50, uh, 50, 59 T bird. Drank the bottle of Knob Creek from the 59 T bird with my friend. Pulled up next to a cop and threw it at it and took off. High speed chase all over LA. Lost him. Drunk as shit, rowdy as hell, all happy, man. I was playing pedal steel that night. Yeah. I was all drunk as. Fucking pedal steel, I, you know, I barely know how to play mine, let alone somebody else's. Somebody else's, you know, different. So I, I got there sound check and started drinking. Then that River Phoenix fucking thing happened, man. That fucking kid died. So I didn't know the fucking kid. I, he was dressed as Eddie Munster. I didn't know fucking him from a hole in the ground. He was. He was dressed as Eddie Munster. Finally, I couldn't play with the fuck. I was out of tune, so I just decided to kick that fucking thing over. Went and tackled Johnny Depp, started pounding him and shit, man. <laughs> Broke his guitar strings and all this bullshit, man. So we get backstage and. Him and Flea and uh, and the drummer Sal, who just joined Depp's butt boy, I go running off the, the side of the stage exit onto uh, Sunset, right off the stage. This leaves me and Gibby alone, like Vikings, coming off stage. Usually we get off stage at a pee show, it's like Johnny Depp, and all the girls are running for him. It's like we're chopped liver, man. So we're walking through the crowd, man, just Vikings, you, come on, back with me, back to Johnny's office, let's go. And they're going, I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Turns out they're like, this guy's dying out there, Eddie Munster's dying, you know? They went out there to see. I didn't know. No one told me, man. I'm drunk, tackling Johnny Depp, flipping him off, throwing up on stage, passing out, and I'm grabbing all like Christina Applegate's running back towards the fucking back, thinking I'm a Viking man. Johnny Depp comes running back ten minutes later. I've got four or five Christina Applegates. I'm talking to this. I'm trying to get rid of the idiot one. Gibby's got four or five Christina Applegates. He's chomping on their hooters and shit. Johnny Depp comes back to his office. Everyone out. Everyone's gotta get out. Everyone's gotta get out now. Everyone's out now. Get out of my way. I look the fucking Johnny Depp. I'm poking him in the chest, going. Look, I'm not gonna tell you how to fucking act, asshole, but I will say this about music. I've been doing it a long time. One of those drunken raps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that real ugly drunk. Love buddy. You yeah. kicked out everybody that fucking saw you out of tune. You wouldn't have any fans left. Like, I go on, be a good boy, get me a Jack and Coke. Come on, come on. <laughs> Next thing I know, I got this bouncer grab me by the ear. Going. People who become famous, they become stars or they become targets. And that's even riskier if you become a controversial cult figure where the people who are into you are so into you that one thing you do and they're disappointed or they just completely turn on you. And if you act any differently than they expect, they call you asshole, sellout or uh, much, much worse. You got these guys out there that listen to albums on hours on end, and 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 they start getting a little weirded out. We're involved in music, but we don't necessarily let it freak us out or anything like that. We don't believe all the stuff that we write. I mean, God forbid. There was this uh, one situation once. I don't remember if it was in Texas or if it was in Oklahoma. Uh, either with uh, 
maybe on a Nine Inch Nails gig, maybe, or or touring at the same time Ministry was touring or something. There was this guy, at least at the time I thought it was a guy, I think it's a guy, uh, that would uh, constantly send letters backstage. Open yourself up. Open yourself What's up. What's wrong? You, you, you were doing the murder? Yeah, you, and, you and still got... got frankincense. Okay, that's sandalwood. I've this got is the sandalwood, right or the sandalwood was on the heart. This is the kind of stuff you just blow off, you don't really worry about. But then I realized I kept getting these weird notes and they were all these little handwritten notes with the smallest printing you could ever imagine. The tiniest little printing on every square inch of a page. Yesterday I got into a cab. Are you ready for this? I got right, my huh? fucking cab in New Orleans and the motherfucker had been there the week before. This little stalker fuck. He went to New Orleans, drove there and fucking checked the side alleys and all that shit. The fucking cab driver, an old black guy, had no fucking idea. How, how could he know? boggling, isn't it? And we got in that cab, and tonight is a full moon. A full, full, officially full planner's moon, all right? So do you understand I'm not fucking crazy now? Uh, these hats really are disorienting because I can't really know where to fucking shoot at to get the scalp and shit like that. I got, an extra fucking, I got an extra one, man. I got an extra couple of top hats. Don't be calling me no Saxon Queen. <laughs> My left hand to God. I want a spoon so bad. I thought you want a spoon. know that there were fun parts of it and there was definitely lots of shitty parts but you have some kind of hope that well maybe maybe it's gonna be better you know may, maybe this next tour maybe this next record you know maybe the bullshit won't be so thick I remember the first time I went to detox they're telling me I should I should get out of the business I'm in because it's just too tempting. That's what causes me my fucking joy. Not for the fucking the, the circus atmosphere of it, but for the actual composition, the feeling of accomplishment, of, of, of being worthy of, of something, of, of, of being active and contributing, creating something good. I don't know how you could live the kind of lifestyle that someone such as Al supposedly lives without attracting at least a few stalkers. If you're doing those sorts of things and it's the truth, then you should have stalkers. In fact, you should want stalkers. You know, you fit this front part to the back part. Yeah, well, that's what I don't know how to do, man. Well, this I'm this not one of these techno. This this right. crap hole it just goes right here, yeah. right? Velcro. And then uh, 
I think you have to put his head. Yeah, get your neck first. in there first. Yeah. Or my ass. So I guess you. Uh, it could be a. It could be a diaper. Yeah, it's. it's you might want to protect that part now. So instead, it depends. Deflex. He's <laughs> gonna <laughs> start using deflex. Deflex. You whip these motherfuckers on, and you say, "Come on, you fucking goats! Get me out!" They can put a man on the moon, they can't make a fucking bulletproof vest with a fucking pocket for smokes. What's <laughs> <laughs> the wrong with these assholes? <laughs> Where's that Bible? There's some bush up top of it. Hey, Greg and Oz, Greg and Oz, Greg and Oz, Greg and Oz, Greg and I just crapped my pants and I have my depends on, I feel confident. But hey, look, we found some better music. A night that wasn't ended by the sun coming up on tour was a wasted night. You know, it's not going to last forever. And it's... By the time the Downward Spiral tour, 94, 95, 96-ish in that era, you know, I was well on my way to full-fledged alcoholism, drug addiction, you know, my own life. And I was starting to see, hey, maybe this isn't all it's cracked up to be, and I'm genuinely miserable, you know, through and through. I'm depressed and I hate myself and and for me, you know, it got to a point where I I didn't want to be that guy anymore, you know, and I didn't know if that was going to cost me. No, I should say at that same time, you know, we're at the peak of popularity and I'm reading about myself as though I'm someone else and now I feel like I have to live up to this vampire-y kind of whatever I've become to people, you know. Back in 1991, on the first Lollapalooza tour, uh, Jane's Addiction, uh, Nine Inch Nails, to name a few bands, uh, we were headlining that tour, and uh, both Perry and I, and Eric Avery, we were all pretty much hardcore, hardcore junkies at that time. So we were all pretty hardcore in our junkiedom. I remember then one day Al showed up to visit Trent, or to say hi or whatever, come check out the show, and all three of us were like, well, that guy's fucked up. Like we were, like somehow he, it made it okay. Like, you know, we were like sitting there tying off and shooting up, you know, coke and heroin and saying, well, at least we're not like that guy. You know, no little did I know that uh, I would eventually get there, you know, cause it's a slippery slope. But I remember, I remember the legend of Al and uh, his chemical abuse. And it was something to be kind of feared and hailed at the same time. I, I... I'm abusing whatever talent I had, and I can't think straight, and I can't make good music, and well, it seems to have something to do with this trail of cocaine residue and liquor bottles that are leading to my passed out body on the floor, you know? <laughs> Tulsa.
Tulsa, Oklahoma. Two guitar players with a little downtime. A white supremacist rally. The perfect occasion to discuss First Amendment rights. And whether or not they're such a good idea after all. Uh, you're listening to Bad Girl. If you would like to write Bad Girl, you can do so at NPS slash Bad Girl. You know, you wonder what, um, what influence it has on, on anything. I mean, you know, what are you doing press for? Why are we playing live? What does it do? Why are we doing it? You cannot tell people what you're doing or why you're doing. All you can do is let it go. No, and then those people have to interpret it for themselves. You know, and why should you give a shit whether somebody mis misinterprets your art? That shit wouldn't happen in Chicago, man, because those motherfuckers would get killed. Yeah, but the thing is, that shit, shit does happen in Chicago. A clan rally? No, I mean, there's racism yeah, everywhere. Nazis. I'm just saying, I don't, I don't think anybody should go out and kill anyone else. But if your life is threatened, I believe that that you should apply equal force to, you know, to that force, or else you're fucked, man. What do you think, Lou Dog? Hey, man, this guy right here is Marty. His name is Marty. He's a motherfucker. Like in the Cosmonauts. And fuck every single one of you white bastards. A lot of forces are trying to bring me back because I'm, I'm becoming dangerously close to intelligent. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've seen enough, I've done enough, I've experienced enough pain, I've experienced enough joy in this life at 37. I've lived two, three, four, five lifetimes with most people. You know? You yeah, do. And I'm getting dangerously close to the intelligence level required to move on. And the yin and yang, the evil, the good, whatever you want to call it, I don't know if evil is the right word, but they don't like that. They want to see people, especially in this world, fail. Mm -hmm. They don't want to see you get close to, to a light, you know? And I can tell the closer I'm getting to a light, the more shit I'm getting, the more, like Nintendo level seven, it gets harder. Yeah. It really is just like that. I can agree with that. And, and I'm happier with myself now than I've ever been in my life. I can goddamn look at you and say I like myself now, which I never could before. At least not, not, you know, and, and be lying. Dope? I was so angry I had to do dope the other day. I'm not having fun on dope. Except that one day with you, I was having a bunch of fucking nuts. I told you about one of my dreams and like weird fucking... Pressure was off and it wasn't to escape. It was strictly to expand, you know? And, and that was fun. And I'd love to be able to do guerrilla tactics and be strong enough to do that. You can't do it yet. I'm not afraid anymore of being alone or of being perceived as wrong or unpopular or whatever. It means nothing to me anymore. And once those shackles are gone, dude, it's, it's, opportunities are endless, you know? That's it, I'm watching, I'm watching. so small and uh, you know every idea and thought I had was all that mattered um, every creative thought I came up with or every avant-garde statement I made became the most important one every paranoia and fear that I came up with every little bit of script that I wrote in my own head became true you know what I mean and it not only became true but I made it a point to convince everybody around me that it was true too, to a degree where it was uh, in, in it, how can I put it? 
I mean, I just, I, I went, I went to any lengths I could to convince people that my fears and paranoias were accurate. You might try and plant something on the bus, the cops. So that's why I'm not going to be on the bus. I'm going to be in the car with a Secret Service guy, Johnny, driving and meeting with the Oklahoma border on the bus. Meanwhile, I'm going to be wearing a fucking bulletproof vest and all the protection shows. I see myself saying similar things to what I've seen Al say and uh, having the same kinds of paranoia and same kinds of, of ideas. And I've watched people just kind of allow me to have them. Uh, one, would, one point is because if they disagreed, the monster that was unleashed was much more intense and horrible to deal with than the guy who was just spouting off these ideas. Do you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you, the people around you are given a choice. Like, do they have monster A, which is somewhat contained, or monster B, which you don't know what the fuck that guy's gonna do, you know? And monster B is a lot scarier, so people just kind of indulge. Just musicians in general, there's, there's, there's something broken in, in them to begin with. Something happened in their childhood that pushed them to get on stage to begin with and to, and to perform or feel the need to perform or express something, whether it's mommy or daddy issues or whatever it was. Uh, and uh, so they're already kind of, you know, volatile humans as it is. There's something missing. There's a black hole. sick I've been sick because I was a drug addict by choice when I was a teenager when I was 11 10 11 12 13 14 15 and then when I turned 16 I was a drug addict without choice what Al and I I think would probably have in common is that we're taking arms we're taking um, our weapons and using them against our enemies I think that's the common thing if there was something, in my opinion, aside from him and I having the same birthday, same, not year, but same birth, October, year, non, month, birthday. It's just that we're taking action. We're not laying back and taking it from the man. We're giving it. I've earned my reputation of being a cunt because I want to be a cunt. I'm not being macho, I'm just being honest. In Texas, I'm definitely wearing that because they keep saying that I'm going to die in Dallas. Yeah? Yeah, that's what they want to shoot me. Who's to say that uh, every single element of his life isn't a total lie? You know, maybe this whole thing is just like an act. This is a real fucking thing, man. Just run around, move room, change this, change that. Hello? Hey, Paul. Hey, Al. How you doing, man? Oh, fuck that. Poor guy can't fucking go on our stage. We gotta get to the end of the skin, Paul. Like, what's again? Or maybe we need to get some fucking gloves. I had to, yeah, I had to tape my drumsticks to my... I mean, literally tape them into my hands for two weeks on that tour. It was the most painful fucking thing I'd ever gone through. It was horrible. Hey, you're going. Go. Okay, all right. Let's go. So many of your admirers are fanatics. 
you may begin to wonder if someone in the crowd isn't out to get you. And if you do a lot of cocaine, you'll most likely become certain that someone is out to get you. And you never know. Maybe someone really is out to get you. Oh, this is fucked up. This is the last tour I'm fucking doing, period. Ever. Well, what do you mean? What do I mean is that I'm not gonna fucking risk my fucking ass for this. I fucking go to sleep every night, scared shitless. Different names, different hotels, hiding around, fucking in and out of fucking venues, fucking... Because the fucking press decides to fucking decide I'm satanic or something, so they need a fucking nut in the world, like, you know... I, can't, I don't have a life anymore. There's no way to live. First thing you should know, yeah. the cop was recommending this one over this. He said this will stop anything that they're going to carry in and get us. This will stop a 45. He doesn't think he can do a show with it. I mean, he's willing to try it, and it's okay to sort it up and don't take it. He's just telling you this is probably better for you to try to do than this. No. I do all this idiot preparation to the point where it gets like... I got too many things to remember these days. I gotta change room twice a day. Change the names. I get a prank call to the room. What happens? The first day, you know, fucking I let anybody know what hotel we're staying at or anything. Prank call to start out my morning, you know, tear gas. I'm not, I'm not scared, man. I'm just cautious, you know? They can't frighten me, but we'll fuck it. I won't let him. I just won't let him. I, can, I consider every person a definite, not a possible, but a definite stalker waiting to happen. It's, it's so cliche, but you bottom out. Some of us bought, bought them out a number of times until you know we're hard-headed about it, and and those are the real survivors, you know. And and uh, Al is a real survivor. You know, Al is someone who. Uh, I mean, has taken enough stuff to drop three or four elephants. And uh, again, with me too, I mean, I, I think, and with a lot of these, these people, you reach a point where you're absolutely fed up with it. You're absolutely fed up with feeling that way. Uh, absolutely fed up with feeling that way. And you have to make a choice. You're faced with, you know, slow disintegration, you know, not pretty, or maybe you'll OD, or maybe you won't, but chances are you won't because you haven't yet. And uh, so it's slow disintegration in a really kind of ugly latter part of your life, or you, you, uh, you, you choose to kind of put that behind you. And it's like, okay, I've opened that doorway, now it's time to close it. You know, I've taken all I can from this experience. The weaker ones are the ones that can't step away from it. And so I think that's what I would say to most people, is just that, you know, you understand that you have a weakness, then you work with that. Just, just get it over with. Just get it over with. It seemed like there was a spot where ministry could do no wrong. They were on a, a, a roll, but that volatile stuff backstage, the 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 insanity and the chaos and the, and the chemicals and the drinking, I think ended up like taking it out at the knees. And it kind of all of a sudden just you woke up one day and it like it wasn't there anymore. There's a lot of bands that kind of came up that. I was never really fans of them, but they were like kind of blending that hip hop sound with, you know, the industrial uh, grooves and heavy guitars sound that I don't think do it anywhere near as well as, as Ministry did it or Nine Inch Nails did it. But uh, because Ministry wasn't there to to fill in that space, to take up space, and to show them how to do it, it it kind of left a void, and then it just kind of got filled up with stuff like, you know. Limp biscuit and crap like that. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Fred. When I watched some of the Al, t Al footage, I saw this guy behaving and acting in the exact same way as do. Um, but it was, for me, it wasn't shocking on any level, you know, because frankly, I have had more friends in my life, more close friends in my life that behaved like that than behave like you. In as much as people uh, choose to um, challenge themselves at every turn and uh, choose to um, uh, live on emotional extremes or at emotional extremes, then as a consequence, of course, there will be people who uh, die uh, prematurely, if you will. I like the outlaw. 
I like the end of the dog. But I think it's the perfect ending for a perfect band. And have every girl in the fucking cheetahs and every other spearman rhino taking their clothes off to one of his songs. Like Patti Smith said, people have the right. And I hope they take the right back. I hope they take the right back. I hope they take the right back. And here we are, right back where we started. Saxonia. Knowing what you know now about touring with an industrial rock and roll band, you shouldn't be surprised at all how this night turns out. I wanna see the fucking crowd. Turn the lights off. Here's the fucking light. Boom, 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 boom. Well, there we go. Fucking getting somewhere, you fucking idiots. Okay. Saxonia! Yeah, throw shit, that's good too. Yeah, come on. Do something, yeah. There's a whole fucking lot of you. How come there's no fucking noise? Are you all fucking deaf or stupid? Or do we suck? Gotta be one of them, and we don't suck. Well, that really made an impression. You want me to show you my dick or something? I don't even want to see that shit. I think you're stupid. Okay, you're stupid. We're gonna keep fucking playing anyways. Cause we're just as stupid as you. I just went back in there now, he doesn't have any left. So Ask I'm him, not. please, man. And this better not be a conspiracy to keep Al off drugs. No, it's I've been no, fucking it's sheltered not. enough in my life, right? No, I don't know. Instead, if I find out it's that, there's going to be it's a lot of stuff. I swear to you right now, it's yeah. not. The owl's out of it. That's all you ever hear, you know. That's the story about the ministry. That's, just, that, that's the kind of perennial, you know. And he, of course, feeds it, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, hey, hey, hey. Did you know, you don't know any of this shit. Right. I'm not lying. And I'm telling you, I'm going to go on that fucking crew bus and expect bumps tonight about to be General Patton. But I'm not going to fucking sit there and watch you guys be high as usual.
and me not have shit. I'm pissed. Always. You guys got pot, you got satellites, you got girls, you got fucking everything on your bus. We have shit. Always. Yeah, I remember seeing him in Germany and he was like, I couldn't believe he was going to go on stage to stay. He was only dead, you know. Got through it. But that's it. When you go on stage, everything changes, you know. It's different. Because you become the artiste on stage, right? Any time around it, you're not, you know, you're just some dork, you know. You know, all hypnols? Hypnol? Yeah. No, I don't believe I love that. Very, really, pretty, pretty tasty down. downers. Yeah, when you're on a three day speed binge, this is the best fucking thing in the world. Voila, do one. I'm a fucking Toxic Avenger, I can't do more than one. Oh, great. If you do one, even if you do a full one, pack your bags 20 minutes, write your will, get your clothes up, get to bed. Right. Some of my friends were dead at 23, you know. So piss on them, you know. My veins are king. My needle is king. My drugs are king. My woman is king. We're all kings. It's sex on the earth. I was protecting the town. Yeah. This is Viking blood, yeah. I drip into the glass, yeah. Pass it around, yeah. Let me just say, if this is acting, this is definitely method acting. Someday I'll get to that point where I can reach my own eyes without it. Yeah. And meanwhile, I still. But until then. Until then, <laughs> until then, I don't fucking judge, or I don't want to expect to be judged. Look, you use it while it's fun, and the second it stops being fun, and it's using you instead of you using exactly. it, then stop. Yeah. That's right. And you can't explain that to people. People think you do. If you do it, you're a scumbag. Especially if you shoot it. Oh, then you're a scumbag. Well, you know what? I snorted for fucking six years and my nose got so fucked up. Yeah, my nose kind of hurt right now. So, I mean, I do it this way and everyone thinks I'm an asshole. Well, you know what? I'm no more of an asshole than I ever was. I'm still an asshole. The same asshole. Now, don't you kids try this at home. <laughs> try this at my house, but first get me to do it. Wow, you can find it in a ditch still? I know what I'm doing. I've done it before. <laughs> and then you know what they say? Oh, he takes a cavalier attitude towards drugs. He tells everyone to do it and he's just promoting it and then all these people die and it's my fault. But you know what? It's only my fault when I directly sell it to him and make a profit on it. And which is only happens like four or five times a day. Because in my spare time of being a lead singer, I have so much time to deal drugs to like elementary schools. You see me around all the swing sets, but I give the kids a good deal. I give them a fair shake. I give them clean needles. I don't have a cavalier attitude about drugs. I figure if they're six, they should know about not having dirty needles. I'm there for them. I help them. I make sure they're tied off right and hitting the fucking vein. There hasn't been a single six year old I've lost yet. Satan has given me instructions to be a lot more subtle because I report to him directly, of course, as you know, by reading the fucking music trades and by believing Warner Brothers and all these other people. I mean, Satan and I, it's like Dianetics or diuretics. <laughs> as it is, I'm starting my own cable network called Channel 666. Now, it's going to be like a 700 club and it's going to be a 666 club. They may be 34 better, but we're gaining on them. I have one disclaimer to make over this whole thing, which if you edit it out, people won't even know, but I've been like making this whole thing up and being facetious the whole time, which I have to say because if I don't on film, which you'll probably erase anyway, so it'll never be here, but if I don't, you fucking idiots will believe anything I say.
I'm a singer and an Aries and, and like all those things that come along with just a tr you know just a bad cocktail as far as ego is concerned uh, and, but somewhere along the line I think it might have been having been in the military uh, that you end up having to take a back seat and be a team player and be up at you know be up at this time whether you like it or not be ready to be inspected whether you like it or not you know reach certain thresholds of pain and endurance whether you like it or not um, I think that's the that's the only thing that uh, ended up saving me in a situation where it could have gone sour I could have believed my own press and, and turned it into that kind of you know that weird situation but um, but I think the biggest factor in that is having accidentally stumbled into the starting tool when I was you know with the rest of the guys we were like 27 years old 20 28 years old so we were already past all that kind of weird volatile age where you would you know if you're all of a sudden you're selling a million records and you're 22 that's going to affect you you're going to believe your own press and you're going to become the person that you're being told to be in print and you know with everyday uh, ass kissers and you know yes men you're gonna become that monster and you see it all the time you see every you know the guys who get popular when they're 21 22 23 they're the worst they're just monsters uh, I never really bought into you know the whole mystery and tragedy that was behind you know most bands but de ministry at all I just I just enjoyed the music and and through the years I ended up kind of running into Paul and I think I've actually met Al a couple times, but uh, I'd always heard rumors of, you know, the stuff that goes on behind the scenes and the parties and the and the insanity. But I I was never there firsthand for it, uh, so I didn't really was really on my radar. Yeah, you always have that that element of uh, people romanticizing the the insanity and the chaos that they witness, but they never really put themselves in the shoes of the people that are actually having to, to live with it every day um, and it can, I would imagine that for those people in those more chaotic situations it would be far more difficult to keep the band together for any length of time um, especially if uh, someone thinks that they need to act that way because that's what people expect from the band if all of a sudden that becomes like you know uh, what do you call it um, supported behavior, um, reinforced behavior. Uh, you, just, you can't really maintain that for very long. It ends up exploding. It's very volatile. It's been uh, interesting, this whole journey, yes. And it's the same now, or is it different now? Than say it's different now because people aren't as much fun anymore, you know. People like do tours now like the uh, military exercise, you know. Should be wearing fucking armbands and a thing around the hat, you know, an umpire written on it, you know. Well, I didn't start out as a roadie, but I soon became one. I found out that dope dealing didn't really suit me because I kept getting arrested, so I started being a roadie instead. But I was, a, I was in a band first, and we had a roadie. He was one of our friends from school, you know, the usual thing, like poor devil, never get any money. And uh, being a roadie, I started out. The first roadie thing I did was for the Nice, you know, Keith Emerson's old band. And then uh, Hendrix, of course, for about eight months. So that was a pretty good job. Got all his leftovers, you know. <laughs> well, I got some of his leftovers. Those were rough days too, man. Two of us doing all Hendrix's gear. Not like now, you got 35 people to do four stacks, you know. That's where I found out about it. James Motorhead Sherwood from the Mothers of Invention. Right, that's where I got it. But the band itself, do you have a political motive these days? I'm apolitical, I hate the fucking lot of them. I think they're all swindling, cheating, lying bastards, you know. And, and that opinion has been vindicated every time there's been an election so far. We, we were number one in 1981, you know, that's it, that's a long time ago. Never had a hit since, we've never been in the top 100 here. You know, you, you don't need hits to work, you know. As long as you can sell tickets, so you'd be all right. And anyway, they deserve us. Fuck them. <coughs> <coughs> OK.
because I never thought normal was very interesting anyway, you know. All the normal people I knew sucked, you know. <laughs> As they still do today, you know. Well, you know, you never get any peace and there's people running around you all the time telling you how wonderful you are and it's really a drag, you know. Because you know the fucking yes men from the various agencies that are all around, you know. And you get cut off from everything that you like doing too. Can't go out, you know, because you're too famous, you know. And I'm just famous enough where I can walk in anywhere, you know, without three bodyguards and all that shit, you know. I wouldn't want to be number one again, that was fucking terrible. I'm quite happy being second echelon, it's really good. You get to get off stage and there's still some girls there, you know. <laughs> as soon as you start saying, don't you know who I am, you know, that's, that's the end, you know. People don't hate us, really, I don't think. Although you can get shot for love as well, can't you? Yeah. It's all dumb luck. There's no insurance, you know. It's random, man, the whole thing. There is no God, you silly buggers, you know. <laughs> it's hard to say you think something somebody's influenced by you without coming across like a jerk, you know. It's like, yeah, they sound like us. Yeah, that stuff's really great because it sounds like us. You know, it's just, I don't know. Um, uh, I'd like to think that they were influenced by us. That'd be great. You know, cool. Better us than, than uh, uh, L.A. Guns or something. You know, I don't know. G and R. You know, we're really influenced by G and R. You know, it's like, ugh. no thanks. Or maybe they'll see him. Ministry starts with an M. Melvin starts with an M. You know, maybe maybe they only buy. You know, maybe they'll see it right now. You know, or who knows how, how that works. At first, I thought it was just some freak that was just, you know, had a lot of time in his hands. But I started realizing that they're writing a lot of stuff about me and a lot of stuff about Al and how we connect and how that we maybe are related or something. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, where do you go with that kind of stuff? What do you do? And, and after a while, I, I, quite frankly, got really worried about uh, even going out to whatever vehicle we were traveling in. I'd wait sometimes till four or five in the morning to even leave the club. And it all gets really weird. And then uh, I took to where I heard this story about Keith Richards where he used to carry around this big bat. And uh, uh, I started carrying around a bat for quite a number of months. As, and, uh, you know, I just figured that uh, anybody with any sense about him at all probably should carry the, a bat or the uh, legal equivalent of a bat at any given moment. You know? Just keep people at, at bay, at arm's length. Maybe only within smelling distance. Um, uh, Ministry. You know, I was always a big fan of their first album. We need more relentless pounding and less melody. You know? Definitely. The more the merrier. The more completely antisocial, with no redeeming value whatsoever, the better. Should be. Records should get worse and worse as far as the hideousness of the sound goes as a band's career goes on. To always try to make something that's far more difficult to listen to than what you've done in the past. Even if it's only one song per record. Something hideous. Stinkingly hideous. And I think they're just the band to do it. <laughs> the late 80s and early 90s were a really, really cool time for music, at least at first, because it was wide open. And people were doing so many different things. Hardcore had gone stale and pop punk hadn't really taken over, thank God. I mean, there was lots of REM clones, but people wanted something with teeth. We're going in all kinds of different directions from that real depth charge, heavy duty stuff that the cop era swans were doing or early Sonic Youth and then the dwarves taking 60s garage punk and just mutilating the hell out of it. Mud Honey's Touch Me I'm Six single that launched the whole grunge thing. Uh, all kinds of different things were going on. Where was this all going to go? And another one of the things that really that I really got into was what some people called cyberpunk. And of course, uh, you know, the, the, so, sort of the epicenter of really good cyberpunk, at least the first, first, first people were paying a lot of attention to Fetus, and then uh, back came the heavy guitars with Ministry.
Al is the Jerry Lee Lewis of our generation, for better and for worse. And uh, I found out the hard way that, that many of the things you think are exaggerated stories he's telling actually happened and happened to actual people. And uh, what goes up sometimes comes down. And when you're in that condition, especially with Al's personality, you know, he soars higher and he probably, when he's happy, he's happier than anybody on the face of the earth. And when things crash and burn, it's probably darker and more painful than it is for most people. But it's amazed me over the years the things he can get away with. I mean, I mean, at one point, uh, the drug use got so bad that he was having uh, trouble controlling his bladder and started wearing adult uh, continence pads, diapers, whatever you want to say, which would embarrass the hell out of most people, especially musicians. There are other older icons who do it, too. But Al told me in uh, Australia on the Big Day Out tour, he was doing a TV interview for a major network and just took the mic and said, Hey, listen to this. I'm pissing in my pants right now. And uh, in one way, that's hilarious. In another way, I, it's, when I go to Australia, that seems to be the main thing they remember. Two things about Al. That and that the show was really good and the band was great. Al and Ministry did not get to where they are without playing the games the majors wanted them to play early on. After all, Ministry started out as a uh, very calculatedly mainstream synth-pop vehicle, although even then, apparently there were things like Al being brought to a party by the Arista suits and introduced by their flagship artist. This is Barry Manilow. Oh, hi, is it true you have a latex butt? So, it seemed like in the more down moments for Ministry and Al around Dark Side of the Spoon time, or a little, a little earlier, he uh, was more sensitive and angry at times at people who had clearly learned a lot from how he made what he makes and kind of stole his thunder in the commercial arena at one time or another. Um, he told me that he actually had to pay out several thousand dollars to somebody who sued him for uh, punching him in the face when the guy mistook him for Rob Zombie. And I can see why Al was a little upset when Astro Creep 2000 came out and there's uh, Rob looking uh, more like Al than he ever had, complete with a very similar hat and all. I wonder how he feels about Johnny Depp at this point, because the minute I saw Pirates, the, the first images of Pirates of the Caribbean, I thought, aha, Johnny Depp is dressed up as Al for Halloween or something. And now he claims the character was based on Keith Richards, but I have a feeling I know who it was uh, really based on. Well, I'm getting all these nice things and rewarded and congratulated and praised, rewarded through money and everything else. For doing this thing okay now it's time to do a new thing and there's a there's a juggling act that goes on of do i want to give them what they want you know which i i made and i guess i could or do i have to follow this thing that's going to bum everybody out probably you know but might be greater in the long run but you know it's uh I, again i'd like to say those things never enter into your mind and when you write you go in a room a lead room that keeps that all you know external stimulant but that's not the way it works for me. You know, you're aware that, you know, if I put a record out that there's not any chance any song could ever be hummed or remembered or put on a radio or whatever, then I can't be disappointed when, oh wow, it didn't go that way because it doesn't have those things in it, you know. But when I was around now, early 90s, um, it was impressive. You know, <laughs> the kind of legacy and the level of uh, not PC, you know, not not no flannel fucking shirt and save the earth. You know, it was like finally getting the courage and just beating my head against the wall enough to realize that I, I, I'm either going to die or I've got to um, get my shit together. Um, took me a while, but I chose to get my shit together at the risk of not being losing what might have been good you know maybe i need that the romantic notion of i need to be high to be inspired or whatever it might be you know but it was more important to me even if i lost all that just to be alive and try to redeem myself in my own 
my own eyes. And, you know, as I found that, you know, it's honestly more fun for me now, it's certainly more fun and rewarding to be present and feel like I'm doing some of the best stuff I've done. I'm not reliant on anything else, and I remember it, you know. You know, I quit drinking, but I've discovered caffeine, and you know, you just keep <laughs> drinking coffee, and it's just fucking great. There was two different people, two different personalities. Al was an extrovert, I was an introvert. We both had our, our insecurities. We both were dealing with the same energies, but the reaction to it was different, and what people were, uh, maybe uh, in, in some way, what they were attaching themselves to was different within it. And the study to me was just that, you know, A, Al is an amazing personality and Al uh, could, uh, could always create this energy on stage and it, it dealt with controlling the opposites and almost pushing somebody to their very limit to make them angry or to make them fall apart. Earlier on in my career, I was always uh, a, a bit worried that if kids met me uh, and didn't see the psychopath on stage, but saw that this person actually could put words together and, and uh, you know, was kind and, and compassionate, and, uh, which, which I always was. The greatest kick for me was sometimes going out and talking to the kids who didn't get in the show. You know, the street kids that didn't have the money and stuff like that. And uh, they would always be outside by the bus. And it was far more interesting to me than being backstage and talking to the industry people and just that, that whole pile of shit. You know, I, I got way more out of those experiences. And when kids did actually meet me, the, 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 the fascinating thing for me was, was that they actually embraced that, you know, because it was kind of, it, it completed the picture for them that, that they didn't have to just be angry and violent and da da da, that this was just a form of expression and it was something that we all share and that we all, you know, it's not, you know, it's not something that you should tuck away and, and, and uh, repress, you know, it's something that exists within all of us. Maybe that's, you know, when I look back on it now, maybe that's something that, that people did attach to and, and was actually kind of a more positive, you know, message out of all of that anger, darkness, uh, you know, pseudo-Satanism, or whatever it is, you know. Al's politic, the, the, the politic at its, at its very core was the same. I think what we, um, what we talked about, what we were in dissent against is the same. It's just the effect is different. And I think that comes down to the music in a lot of ways. The, the, the volume, the, the how ferocious it is and, and the, you know, that, that aggro side of the music, that's something that again is so tribal and so, so um, inherent to, 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 our, to our own civilization going back to when we were cave people. I listen to ministry to this day and uh, you know, that's never going to be done. The magic is never going to be done. We have it. It's captured as far as where they're at now and what they're doing. You know, I don't really I don't know, but I, I can tell you that uh, uh, if they're playing, I'm going to go check it out, you know? I mean, there's, that's one band that has really stayed true to what it's been about all this time. I haven't given up on any of my old loves, my old, my old tastes, and, you know, that band, I mean, you know, we play them here at the radio station all the time, you know, and, uh, you know, it will always be a part of, of who I am and what gets me off, and and uh, a way to to feel uh, connected to an emotion, you know, the to the drama, to the show, you know, because for for better or for worse, that show, that drama, is uh, a very very real part of life that I think everybody can identify with. I just don't know if everybody wants to identify with it sonically, but we all have those feelings. You know, when you're talking about the disease of addiction, it's not really about <laughs> pleasing anybody else. I mean, the fact of the matter is that it's a destructive, um, horribly lonely, miserable existence when you get into the, you know, the levels of the depths of, of where I got to, and certainly a lot of my peers have got to. Um, you know, frankly, 
we were unaware of what the record label wanted. You know, we could give a fuck. You know, I mean, because you know, you'd have the side of the company that's like loves the mystique and loves the mystery, and then you have the side that wants to throw you into rehab, and you can tell them all to go eat a dick. To be honest with you, you know, because it's so the world becomes so small. I never got to go to the shows. I was too young as before. I never really got to go to any concerts, any of that kind of shit, because my parents were super, at the time, super Christians, and I was I wasn't allowed to do that kind of stuff or stuff like that. So I was in the, you know, listening to those records that I hid in the middle of the night when my parents were sleeping, had their headphones on. I was totally into this stuff. So yeah. this shit was crazy, and all the uh, drummers and five, fifteen guitar players and all this shit on stage, and it was just dark. It wasn't all lit up crazy or anything. It was just like. The fuck is this? This is this, this, some sick shit. And he'd have his big hat on. You couldn't really see his face. All you saw was a beard and the long black hair. And you're like, who is this fucking crazy motherfucker right here? I really loved that scene. And I loved Skinny Puppy and I loved Ogre stuff. And that whole Chicago the wax tracks, that whole scene, all those bands that came out. It's like a TV, fucking pig face, all, all those bands. Um, I don't think any of them were around if it wasn't for ministry. and. Miss Kenny Puppy and those bands that really started that shit out. Um, straight, no, I mean, you talk to, like, maybe Limp Biscuit that did Thieves. They, they cover that, they do that shit live. And what pissed me off more than anything in the world about that, that fucking Limp Biscuit fans thought that Limp Biscuit did that. I wanted to punch people in the fucking face because of that. I wanted to punch Fred in the fucking face because they did that and kids thought it was a fucking Limp Biscuit song. That's so fucking disrespectful. I was fucking pissed when the kids were like, will you play that? The Limp Bizkit song thing. I was like, oh, it made my blood fucking boil. After their show, I ended up hanging out at... God. Sorry, my brain's fucked from all the drugs I did over the years. Um, Timothy Leary's house. Fucking trippiest night of my life because I'm sitting there and I'm at Timothy Leary's house cutting cheese with him. Or hors d'oeuvres talking about I don't know God knows what but in his fucking house there was a room full of musicians there's a room full of fucking artists watching a cure cure the, the Japanese at that time that just came out so it's all these artists musicians like fuck another room full of like just writers and poets it's like I was like in the middle and it's this corner just started and we hadn't even signed and I was around all these guys around helmet those guys were heroes to me Jesus lizard and fucking therapy and all this crazy shit and I just remember just like holy shit this is what it's all about I'm at fucking Timothy Leary's house holy Jesus shit Christ I'm with a helmet and the Jesus lizard and therapy and those were all like I love those bands and I'm talking to all these I'm all, this is like out of a fucking the Doors movie or some shit you know it was like what my rock and roll fantasy was all about so I'm like, like a super amazing night I'll always remember the rest of my life Ministry, what do they sound like? Well, when I first heard them in Canada, it was ironic that the guys from Vo Voivod were there, some of the guys from Voivod. Um, and I was with Christian Death. Two bands, synchronously, that's the word I just made up, um, have created their own sounds. They're very on, Voivod isn't the most metal band, and Christian Death isn't the most hardcore goth band. They're just music. They're just anti-music. They're just noise. They're just a condiment. I was finger-fucking this girl on the dance floor. And she's like, I love this song. And I was like, I don't know what song it was. But it was like kind of industrial. But now I know it was the first song of Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste. You know, for me, as I mean, as an individual, I, I'm like really attached to the transformation the man's made from being, you know, I remember somebody told me their first record and I listened to it and, then, and it was a great pop record, but the transformation the man made from being a pop sensation to being an absolute devil, which is a compliment in my world. But being a devil behind the music, you know, I hear all the garbage just coming out of the scene and I had to step away. I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't like it. It bothers me. 
that people are so easily, so easily bought. That's, you see, he's brilliant. I'm not like that. I'm not able to identify with someone so smart. He's very smart. That guy's smart, man. Everyone's got their flaws. Drug addicts, fucking junkies, fucking lunatics. But hopefully, in the future, from right now, people will make a difference with their problems. Problems. That's what it's about. Not the perfection of... Not the perfection of... But the imperfection of... Everyone needs the perfect mistake. And that's what will give the world a new life. And the individual a new life. The perfect mistake. Psalm 69, we were riding away the popularity, which, you know, which has subsided now, and, and now we're playing, you know, to our fans, to our core fans. Um, so there isn't that money, frankly, you know. We trust one another. I mean, we work together a lot, and we, and we trust our expression, and we trust, we always allow the other person to take the idea as far as they can, so to speak, until one or the other says, you know, look, this is a bad idea, and then you drop it, or, okay, this, this is cool like this, but what if we take it this direction, and then we just, you know, just kind of change it and, and allow it to grow. Um, I, I guess, I mean, sure, there's a fair amount of insecurity there. I mean, that's what, that's what makes it a challenge, and that's what, that's what makes you excited about it, because you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. You don't know how it's going to end up. Yeah, it's totally beautiful. I mean, the beauty of it, right? But uh, on the other hand, um, I guess we've, we're secure enough to know that we will still have bad ideas and we don't give a shit, we can always throw them out because we'll have more ideas. I suppose it's human nature to alter your consciousness. I mean, when you go to sleep, you're altering your consciousness. You know? So I don't know. I don't know. You know, I don't know what, what is going on in Al's head, and, and that's the beauty of it. I mean, he doesn't know what's going on in mine. I mean, we talk about it, and, and um, you know, we try and lead each other. I wouldn't, I mean, I suppose it's fair to say that if what we do with ministry isn't wholly satisfying to me, then I will continue making music on my own. Mm -hmm. um, but what's, what's one of the cool aspects of, of the side project side projects is that, you, you know, you can express yourself in a way which isn't so narrowly focused as, in, in my case, ministry, right, or kind of music that I want to make on my own. And you, you, once again, you start working with other people, you get excited, you know, you, you understand where they're coming from, and, and you play with that. Um, so it's very, it's very enriching, you know, for the overall growth. Well, I guess I had the um, good fortune to uh, be raised by my aunt and uncle uh, in an environment uh, where, um, you know, all of my <laughs> basic needs were taken care of, you know, food and shelter and clothing. Um, and um, I uh, managed to um, be an in, an, in an environment where uh, the artistic um, temperament, if you will, was uh, only mildly allowed. Um, my aunt and uncle were both public educators, uh, teachers, and um, my uncle was a painter as well, and um, they really wanted um, their kids to, uh, I was one of six, uh, their kids to um, excel at whatever they wanted to do. That was the ultimate goal. So it wasn't necessarily, um, um, had, it didn't, um, the, what I was taught as a kid wasn't to um, try and, you know, climb a social ladder or a, 
uh, corporate ladder or anything like that. It was basically to uh, satisfy yourself, if you will, um, and realize that uh, that is the be all and end all of life as we know it. It's just like any like uh, sitcom or reality show or movie or anything. It's satire for the people that are making it because it's a controlled circumstance and you know the parameters. I think for out front, the illusion of it is, is such that uh, it becomes reality. And in, in, in that case, it's just like uh, you're, you're preaching to a very um, disillusioned, or not disillusioned, but um, duped audience. I mean, it's a show, for God's sake. It's, it's, it's not reality. It is your reality for that moment in time, but how it affects the overall reality, it certainly isn't reality. I didn't want it to fall apart. You know, I, you know, Mikey had left. That was a drag. What I started to see was the envelopment of the sickness, of the disease, and how it just engulfs everything and just blankets the, the entire thing in this layer of shit. Myself, I was being sucked in to the vortex of the disease, you know. What? Hey, I'm not taking no fucking bus tomorrow at one. Fuck We're it. all taking a train. Yeah, fuck it. So, fuck it we gotta boat. race because Barker wants a train, Ray wants a train, Louie wants a train. So, we'll take a train, train at six. <laughs> Or something. There's almost enough guys to have it. Yeah. Well, we're not taking a bus. What I'm hoping, though, is that we see, when we get to Belgium, we got that nymphomaniac that we had on the Cox tour. <laughs> I'm serious. Wait till you see that shit. <laughs> you familiar with it, didn't you? Belgium. Belgium. Yeah. Oh. Dude, what, what, what date is that? Is it the 10th or 11th? Brussels, 13th and 14th. And she lives, she still lives there? Sure, she does, dude. We're, we're in trouble. Because <laughs> she fucked everyone, man. Except Barker and Rifa, who hid. She even tried to rape him on the elevator and shit. She was insatiable. She didn't speak English. She's like, please, please, make love me too. You know, she like that. Just like, just pawing at you, blowing you, like, you know, just one second and be, you know, go, you know, what's your name? I, I, I know speak and zip, I she know speak English, zip. Dick in her mouth, like, everyone, man. I, I had to call up the crew, like, help, man, please, stay away, get your hands off me, no more, come on, no more, please, come on, get up here, someone else fuck her, man, she will not take no for an answer, so I'd sit there and, like, she'd still be trying to paw at me while somebody else is fucking her, and then, you know, and then she'd get into it with that guy for a while, thank God, I'd have some cigarettes and wait, and then this guy'd be, like, screaming, come on, Al, that's it, come on, come back here, you fucking for a while. And she was all right looking, too, man. Mm -hmm. Fuck, she had these, like, what we call her fucking doe eyes, man. Just like, just like, like nobody would fuck me now. Look, you know, it's like, whoa, it's like so weird, man. She was like a fuck creature. She had to have sex 24 hours a day, constantly. That's weird. I've never met anyone like that. Have you? No, I never have. Never that was, have. It's almost like a dream come true. So <laughs> be careful what you dream or what you yeah. wish for, because it may come true. And this was that's perfect example of like okay here's your ultimate dream a chick that doesn't speak your language doesn't speak just fucks 24 hours a day but then you'll see that that gets tiring too man it's like that ain't all that it's whipped up to be and she's great in bed and everything too it's mm -hmm. not like you know she was shitty it's just like fuck come on man like you ever heard of eating can we go eat for a while <laughs> no not eat my dick again get away don't touch come on not now don't touch it ah oh, fuck here we go again jeez <coughs> it's like one of those deals man Barker and Reefle get in the elevator, she's like, you know, you too. <laughs> and they're like, you know, trying to like fucking get out of the elevator, she just, <laughs> just slammed it down. And you hear Barker and Reefle going, cut it out, cut it out. Hey, hey. You know, Barker's like, no, I beg, I beg your pardon. I really don't feel that it's you know, appropriate to uh, have a sexual encounter in the elevator. Just, hey, hey, please, please, you can't you keep your hands to yourself. You know. Why do you see him doing that? 
told him, I, I, I even told Tommy Fino we're gonna communicate the head of Warner's that I would smear my dick in mustard and the first 500 would sign my name in dick mustard as best as I could in Alan Jorgensen with my dick as a pen wrapped in French's mustard or Dijon. The first 500 and they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll get back to you. I'm more of an author groupie anyways, as opposed to like a, a rock groupie. I mean, I know how it's done and it, it really holds no interest for me. Um, I mean, it's the same with anything else. Like author groupies are sports, uh, um, authors or, or, or sports persona. Uh, they always look, the grass is greener on the other side. Like uh, we have jock fans. Professional baseball, football, hockey players that just think ministry's the shit, or or whoever's the shit, whatever band, and uh, you know, to them that's like this ideal foreign world, and it's just the same as their world. It's all entertainment, and uh, just like we go to a sporting event and go, wow, that's amazing. Especially if you like played any kind of high school sports or semi-pro sports or whatever sports or leisure sports, you just think like, wow, what they're doing is amazing. And um, it's just all entertainment. They look at us the same way we look at them. I hope locusts come. I hope <laughs> pestilence. Wouldn't that be cool?